listen up. I want my city gear. City gear, city gear. Listen up. Yeah, I mean, I started it, I started the brand in 97. Um, and I literally didn't really want to start a brand in the beginning. I just wanted to like, I got ideas in my head and I was just trying to like get them out. Um, and instead of doing it at, as artwork, I decided to do it on t-shirts. That was really the first medium for me. I felt like, you know, young people and fashion are like, they're so interlinked and it's such a great like means of communication. Um, that I felt like fashion was actually a more powerful way of saying something than like art on a wall, you know? Mm -hmm. So it started as uh, just making t-shirts for my friends to wear and then they'd wear them around and then there was one shop in New York that saw the shirt that I was wearing and just placed an order. And that was the first time I really like, I didn't even think like, wouldn't even place an order. Like it didn't even make sense to me, you know? Right. And they were like, no, nah, we'll make 12 and we'll sell them in here. I was like, okay. That could work, you know, so I hand printed 12, oh, gave wow, it to, printed. I was hand printing everything, yeah, in school, yeah. yeah. I was going to design school and hand printing every shirt back then. Well, the cool thing is when they sold out in a week, and I was like, wow, that's weird. Because think about that, everyone that wore staple before that knew me personally, mm -hmm. right? They were my friends. Right. Now, when they were like, it's sold out, I'm like, that's weird, like 12 people who don't know me now just paid money for a shirt. You gotta think like, it really, it, it, it transcends a lot of things because, you know, people work hard for their money and they come in here and spend their hard earned money on some clothing, right? Mm -hmm. And me, 5,000 miles away or wherever, am designing this thing in a, in a closed room you know, making it, and then somehow through like the ether of the universe, this person now respects what I did in this room six weeks or six months ago, and is now supporting me by putting his hard earned money into my pocket to support that vision that I had. Mm -hmm. We never had a conversation, we never met, you know, and that still really gives me goosebumps. Like, wow, that's so weird, you know? The spring 2015 collection, um, we call it, the concept is called Future Perfect, or, you know, and, the basic concept behind it was take silhouettes that people know really well. So like baseball jerseys, you know, button down shirts, but then remix it in a way that presents it as a new thing. So we, I mean, I'm looking at two examples perfectly right there. We did a button down shirt that is inspired by a baseball jersey, but then we did a baseball jersey that's inspired by a button down shirt. So we kind of like mishmashed and remixed staples for lack of a better word like things that you know very well you know like the button down shirt that looks like a baseball jersey is yeah. up there so like we kind of remixed it um let's see should i let you in into my into my pandora's box we we always plan like a good year and a half out you know so we're our oh, i'm already thinking about like summer 2016 you know fall 2016 and for me, it's important that um, we try to keep expanding on our audience base. You know, like we know, it, it's weird, like my sales guys and my marketing guys will tell me like, yo, we know what sells. So you need to keep pumping out the shit that sells, right? And I'm always the one that's like, let me try to it, sprinkle some stuff that not maybe won't sell, but I'm trying to push the envelope out and like, test people and like bring them to a place that maybe they're not 100% comfortable with yet. But that's kind of my job because I have to look into the future that like today they might not be comfortable with it, but a year and a half from now, it might be the shit. So I have to, you know, if by the time a year and a half rolls by and I'm thinking like, oh, we should have done that, it's too late, I missed the boat, you know? So it's important that I keep trying to push the envelope a little bit, you know? Uh, not a whole lot, to be honest. I mean, it changed the business, but uh, it's funny because it's the 10-year anniversary um, in a couple weeks, and um, they're shooting a documentary. There's a documentary being made about the pigeon dunk, which is crazy that there's a documentary being made. Like, they're interviewing the cops that were at the scene, the security guard that worked it. Yeah, they're interviewing the lady who wrote the article for the New York Post. Like, they're re it's like a... Like, first 48 hours. Yeah, exactly. They're going back, like, what was it like for you, you know? <laughs> um, so, it's cool that they're making a documentary about it. Um, but for me, I've always been a sneakerhead since the sixth grade. So, to me, the, the dream was when Nike asked me to make the shoe. That was the life changer in my life. When it came out, and kids went crazy, and there was a riot and all that, 
that was just sort of like just the course of doing business. That's like as exciting as doing a meet and greet like this. Like it's just, wow, that's like the fruits of my labor. Yeah. It's not really, the, the cool part is, is the labor part, not the fruits of it for me, you know? So it didn't really change my life. I think it changed the course of sneaker culture, the Pigeon Dunk did. Uh, you know, I think prior to the Pigeon Dunk, um, there was only a small group of people that were really crazy about sneakers and after the pigeon dunk because of the news and because of the you know the newspapers and everything that it was on it became this blown up thing I mean I saw it overnight in my retail store where like that that next weekend people in business suits were coming in being like yo well, I, I need to buy sneakers I heard about it on the news I need to buy some sneakers yeah like they would buy they were the type of people that would like buy wine and cigars and now they're like I need to collect sneakers yeah, so it really changed the industry overnight. Uh, yes, I'm glad you noticed too. But you look at the blogs now and it's just, yeah, collab, collab, collab. It's like, where's the normal shit? Like, where's the regular like stuff, you know? So what, what I've, that's one of the things that I've been trying to do as like my long-term vision is like put a lot more investment and time into making the core line fly. Like I want to make our, and I think it's working, like I want to make our inline product as hyped and in demand as other people's collabs. And then when we do do a collab, like we're dropping Timberlands today, actually in New York, like then they go, they're super fire, you know, versus I see people who do collabs and then the collabs are on the discount rack a couple weeks later and no one buys them, you know, it just shows it's, you're abusing the collab. So I'm trying to like put purity back into the main line and make collabs the deserved special thing. I, I think we're gonna change the world. Streetwear is going to change the world, I think. I think we came out of an era where there was like, you know, urban was really big, right? So it was like clothing, if you think about urban as like clothing lines personified by rappers, right? So Jay-Z, Rockaware, Diddy, Sean John, right? Like these were, these were clothing lines that were backed by rappers. Before that, you had skate was really big. Skate and surf was really big. So you had clothing lines backed by Tony Hawk and Kelly Slater and like athletes basically, right? So now we have clothing lines backed by designers. So you have Bobby Hundreds doing something, right? You have me, you have Scott Sasso doing 10 Deep. These are designers actually doing clothing lines. The last time that happened was Ralph and Tommy, right? So that's why I think it's totally different because with Urban and with Skate, clothing lines lived and died by how well their album sold or how well they did in the X Games. That's a totally different dynamic. If, if Jay put out two bad albums, or if Diddy put out a bad record, Sean John Sales goes down, right? If Tony Hawk doesn't win the X Games, his clothing line goes down. But me, I'm just predicated on like, the, the success of Staple is based on how much longer I can design for, not how many kickflips I can do or how many platinum albums I can sell. I don't plan on making an album, so don't worry. Oh. Yeah, I know. But that's why I think streetwear could really be the next like American resurgence of fashion, which the last time that happened was Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger and Nautica, Perry Ellis, which was like late 70s, early 80s when they came about. I think we're looking at that moment again, you know? Yeah. Like I think Scott Sasso, myself, you know, Nick Diamond, like, you know, Publi the guys from Publish, these are all people that could be the next great American designers, you know. I want to thank all you guys for supporting, you know. I was just telling, I was telling my friends on the way over, I was like, do you think people even like Staple in Texas? So I was like, it's, you know, I, I work so hard that like, I don't really look outside and like, check out the fans and stuff, you know, like, I just, I just try to put out the best work possible and then, you know, it's nice to see that there's an audience here that like, really appreciates what I'm doing, so I appreciate you guys.